Non-spatial clustering, or simply clustering as it's referred to in the statistical literature, is about grouping observations based on their statistical similarity, or in other words, based on how similar they are as measured by a series of different variables. Let's explore the intuition behind clustering, and then we'll move on to a few of the algorithms that are most popularly used, in particular one, and we'll wrap up the clip with an example of how clustering is being used in the real world to make policy decisions. What's the intuition of non-spatial clustering or, or clustering? Well, it's about splitting a data set into groups of observations that are similar within the group or within the cluster, but dissimilar across clusters. And this similarity is based on a set of attributes. So you will see later, and you might come across if you read uh, further in the literature, that there are many, many techniques for performing clustering. The key thing that all of them share is that at the end of the day, they're all different approaches to split a data set into a series of groups or clusters or categories in a way that every observation in, in the cluster is more similar to the other observations within that same cluster than to observations in other clusters. And that similarity is always defined based on some measure of statistical similarity using data, using variables. More uh, pragmatically, you can think of a data set made up of rows and columns, a table. In this data set, of example, Every row is an observation. You can think of it as a neighborhood, as we'll see later in the example, or as individuals, or as firms, or as um, different sample collections. Now, for each row, we're going to have different columns measuring different aspects of these uh, entities. For the neighborhood example, we can think of every column as a different type of characteristic. For example, the average income, the number of people with education above university, the number of um, parks, etc. Now, what clustering is about is about splitting this data set. So we're going to segment our table into groups of rows in a way that rows or neighborhoods in our example within the group are going to be within a given group, sorry, are going to give, be more similar to each other than to other neighborhoods in other clusters, or in other words, that they will be uh, similar within the group and dissimilar between the group. Clustering, in the way I've just described it, is also usually referred to as unsupervised machine learning. And particularly if you're reading text from data science on the, or machine learning literatures, you will see this referred to as unsupervised machine learning or unsupervised learning. Let's start from the back and explain a little bit why it's called machine learning. And the idea behind this learning is that the computer, by running an algorithm like the ones we're about to see, is able to learn some of the properties of the data set without uh, human intervention. So once we prepare the data and once we present it to the algorithm, the algorithm is going to be able to parse through that data set and extract the underlying structure or at least some aspect of that structure. And in that process of parsing through the data and extracting categories, the human is not going to be in the loop. Once you present the algorithm with your data, you won't have to be involved in this, in this process. And this is the aspect of um, the machine or the computer or the algorithm learning about the data without you be having to um, present anything else other than the data. And it's also called unsupervised because when we present the data to the algorithm, there's no a priori structure imposed on how we want it to parse through, how we want it to segment it, what are the categories that we want. We, you will see later in the more practical sides of aspects of this blog that when we, pre, when we run an unsupervised algorithm, 
we don't tell the computer how, well, we will say how many clusters we want, but we won't tell the computer what are the types or the categories that we wanted to, to identify in our data. Instead, what we will say is, here is a table with my data, which represents observations measured along several characteristics. I want you to identify for me these categories. And this identification is going to be done in an unsupervised way, in the sense that the computer will be able to identify them by themselves. What's the intuition behind this uh, parsing of the data that seems a little bit like magic? Well, let's think of an example with only two variables that we're able to represent in a scatter plot. And let's say variable one is represented along the horizontal axis, variable two is represented along the vertical axis. And our data set is made up of all, the, all of these points. Imagine that this, each of these points represents individuals, and for example, variable one represents height, and variable two represents weight. Or you could think of um, firms, and variable one might be size, and variable two might be turnover or sales or any other example that you can think of that helps you understand this intuition. When we consider the data set, remember I was saying your data set can usually be expressed as a table. So the table here is going to be one row for every single dot in this scatter plot, and then one column for each of the variables. So we will have two columns and as many rows as dots this scatter plot has. And this particular data set we can see that has a very unique structure. There's a very clear set of categories, and in this example there are three types of observations. There are some observations that have high values of variable 1 and high value values of variable 2, and they all tend to be um, located in this part of the scatter plot. At the same time, there's another set of observations that have low values of variable 1, but high values of variable 2. And then that positions them in this section of the scatter plot. And then also, at the same time, we have a third cluster, a third group of observations that have low values of variable 1 and low values of variable 2. Now, this is a very stylized data set. Usually, you will not have these amount of separation between the, the classes, but it's a good illustration for what we're trying to do. So the algorithm that we're trying to, um, that we're going to use to try to segment it or cluster it is going to be given the data set without the circles. And in some cases, as in the example that we'll see in a second, we will have to say how many clusters we want. So let's, let's, um, uh, go in the ideal world that we already know that we want three clusters. What the algorithm is going to do effectively is draw in these circles, is identifying from the table of observations that for these three clusters, each of these dots are going to be assigned into cluster two, for example. Each of these dots will be assigned into cluster one, and each of these dots will be assigned into cluster three. The key thing is realizing that the algorithm is going to realize, so to speak, that this group of observations tend to have similar values, that their values for variable one and for variable two are similar, and that thus it would make sense to put them in the same group. This is obvious because we can visualize it in two dimensions, and because, as I said, this is a, a, a extremely simplified example. But the rationale never mind stands when we have a much larger data set with more dimensions that we cannot plot and much less, less clear-cut situations. Still, we're going to have the algorithm parse through the data and identify these sorts of associations between different observations and different values in different variables, and the algorithm will be able to use those to generate this categorization or this classification into different types. So this is the intuition behind what is the unsupervised learning algorithm doing. Now, which algorithm is doing, or which algorithm we pick, or how do they differ, has to do with how they do this process of drawing the clusters and identifying the types. 
and there's a lot of different details that can be um, tweaked for obtaining different solutions. We are going to work mostly with an algorithm called k-means, which is the most popular clustering algorithm by far. It's very good and it's a solid option, but it's also not perfect. And, and in, later on, when you work on your way through the details and intuition of the k-means algorithm in the block, um, you will see how there's some assumptions that it makes and that re results in some drawbacks, but nevertheless is the most um, common algorithm for, for non-spatial uh, and supervised learning or, or clustering. And if you want to get more detail on how, the, how it works and how it creates these categorizations based on data, uh, there's a video on the um, on the website that explains it in in quite a lot of detail how the intuition works and I think it's is very effective. Now this is k-means, but you should also know that there's a lot more algorithms in the unsupervised learning literature, and we if you if you read more uh, books about this part of statistics and machine learning, you might come across names like hierarchical clustering agglomerative clustering, spectral clustering. You might have also seen the term neural networks. There are some neural networks that also perform clustering in the sense that, uh, or in the form that we've just described it. And later in the course, we'll see another clustering ex algorithm called dbscan in the context of points. All of them have different properties, and that's because all of them have been designed for slightly different use cases. So while the intuition remains the same, they all try to do um, a splitting of a data set based on categories and based on statistical similarity, how they define similarity, how they define what it's similar within and dissimilar between, whether they optimize for similarity within or dissimilarity between or a combination of the two, and also the type of data that they're designed to um, be run on, whether it's tabular data, like we've seen in this example, or image data, or text data, or sound data. All of these um, different aspects give rise to different algorithms that try to do clustering on different, on, on, on particular, on, on, ah. all of these cases um, give rise to different algorithms that try to optimize for specific use cases even though the intuition remains the same. So now that we know a little bit more conceptually about what clustering is, let's see an example or an illustration of how clustering is used in everyday activities, and in particular in decision-making in urban policy. The example we're uh, treating is what we will call geodemographic analysis, which is a sub-discipline that was pioneered by Richard Weber, which was a, a a professor in planning at the University of Liverpool, and was started to be put forward in the 1970s. And the idea was, or the origin actually, was identifying similarities in neighborhoods so we could then better target particular neighborhoods that, that met some characteristics. The broader background here was that in the 70s, Liverpool had a uh, pervasive problem of deprivation, and there were several several areas or parts of the city with very low uh, living conditions. The city council decided that wanted to commit funding for helping the development of these areas, but it obviously, or as it's common in this context, it didn't have unlimited funds. and Instead, it had very limited amount of funding, so it wanted to allocate it to the areas that would best be able to benefit from, from this funding. And it wanted to identify which areas were um, the most deprived and, and met certain characteristics of deprivation, not on a single dimension, but on a, on, on a more holistic way. And that's how geodemographics were, were born. So it was an original response or a technical response to the need of the city council and the need of policymakers to target urban deprivation uh, with funding. And as such, then 
That's why we say that he was born really in the public sector. Now, this technique very quickly was identified as useful also by the private sector. And in fact, throughout the 80s and 90s, it, it saw wide adoption in um, areas like marketing, like business, what we would today call business intelligence, consumer targeting, etc. And if you're interested more in the history and details of geodemographic analysis, there's a very uh, good book called The Predictive Postcode that came out in 2018 that has fascinating is a fascinating account of how the geodemographic technique really came to be, but how also it spread both in government and and uh, the private sector to be used in a wider range of. Uh, of use cases that well went well beyond the academic um, niche in which it was it was born. And as an example, if you want to play around a little bit with a modern example of geodemographic, the, there is a um, really cool project run by the University of Liverpool, the Consumer Data Research Center, that has put together a set of interactive maps and interactive resources to uh, provide access to some of the standard geodemographics that the Office of National Statistics and other organizations produce today. And the link is provided on the slides and on the course website.